I'm Dr. Matthew White, and today I'll be talking to you about advanced MRI physics. You should already have had a number of basic MRI physics lectures in order to give you a background to help you understand what I'll be talking to you about today. Our uh, lecture outline for advanced MRI physics is split into part one and part two. In part one, we'll start off with MRA, and a fair amount of our first part of the lecture will be about MRA. There's a number of ways to uh, perform MRA, and this can be without contrast or with contrast. We'll look at time of flight imaging and the gadolinium enhanced MRA. Uh, just cover a little bit phase contrast MRA, which isn't used uh, all that much. And then we'll delve a little bit into uh, MRV imaging, which are really MRA techniques slightly tweaked to uh, see the venous system instead of the uh, arterial system. Then a large topic that's, quote, advanced MRI. It's been around for a number of years now and has fairly wide application. It's kind of more of a technique often used to look at physiological processes since we image faster with it in, in general. Uh, echoplanar imaging, uh, the first section that we'll cover with that is functional MRI. We'll look at the physiology and the, the applications. Then in part two, cover diffusion weighted imaging and diffusion tensor imaging. Diffusion imaging is really uh, probably the most commonly used EPI uh, technique. It's used all the time to predominantly evaluate for acute and subacute strokes. Also has a number of other applications, which could be in viral encephalitis or maybe a diffuse traumatic uh, brain injury. And our echoplanar uh, talk by going over perfusion imaging, how it's performed, how you do it. And then our final topic will be uh, shifting gears and looking at uh, spectroscopy. We'll go over uh, the common spectrum in the brain and some of the applications of uh, spectroscopy within the brain, with the MRI. So with the uh, MRA topics, uh, start off uh, going over kind of general MRA, its applications using neuro applications. Since I'm a neuroradiologist, uh, talk about uh, time of flight MRA and how we use that. We're looking at cerebral aneurysms or potentially arteriovenous malformations. Uh, use a 2D time of flight a little bit. Uh, potentially you could use it a lot. We just use it a little bit and um, compare that to why we use a 3D time of flight versus 2D time of flight. Discussed a little bit about phase contrast MRA, which we're really not using. We use that phase contrast more down with the MRV. And we do a lot of MRA, particularly looking at the cries and vertebral arteries and also looking when we're trying to evaluate aneurysms within the head that have been treated, we use a gadolinium enhanced MRA, and we'll discuss how that relates to uh, sampling uh, the center of case space, how that's done to optimize your gadolinium MRV. The MRV, uh, predominantly we've also moved using uh, gadolinium enhanced MRV to look for venous sinus uh, thrombosis. You can use a time of flight MRVs or phase contrast MRVs, our second most popular that we use is the uh, phase contrast MRV. Okay, so for the MRA uh, techniques for a long time, and we continue to use a uh, time of flight MRA uh, fairly extensively. It's a non-contrast technique. You can use it to look at the carotids and uh, at the, use it for brain MRA. Basically, you're looking at high signal in arteries. We're looking at high signal in blood that flows into where you're imaging because it is unsaturated, so it appears hyperintense. And that stationary tissue where you're imaging, basically the MRI machine has saturated that signal out and made it a hypotense. So hypointense. So you're looking at the inflow of blood into your area of imaging that makes it bright. You're not necessarily applying a contrast. You can also use phase contrast MRA. We are mostly using that uh, for non-contrasted uh, MRVs. Uh, the signal intensity of your phase contrast MRA is actually due to a phase shift that occurs with the blood as it moves through uh, the magnetic field. Uh, it's not related 
and I'm sorry, that phase shift is related to the velocity of the flowing blood. In general, it hasn't been uh, shown to be as robust in performance for MRA as the time of flight imaging, but it has been uh, improving. So the gadolinium enhanced uh, technique is very useful and uh, utilized extensively for uh, MRA, particularly for the neck MRAs where you need to cover a long uh, territory, basically from the aortic arch uh, to the skull base, time of flight imaging. You can do that, it ends up taking a long time, but with the uh, gadolinium enhanced neck MRA, you can get uh, coverage uh, with uh, good resolution from the aortic arch to the skull base in, uh, you know, a minute, minute and a half, or something like that. You can also use your gadolinium enhanced MRA for looking at a spine, looking for uh, fistulas, arteriovenous malformations. We use a lot of gadolinium enhanced MRA uh, evaluating uh, stented and uh, coiled aneurysms in the head to see if there's any residual flow. The time of flight MRA technique is a T1 weighted technique. It's a T1 weighted gradient echo technique. So that means things that are bright on T1 weighted images will be bright on it. Uh, in fact, the gadolinium enhanced MRA techniques, as you might guess, are also T1 weighted techniques since gadolinium causes P1 uh, high signal slash T1 enhancement. So uh, basically, as I stated earlier, you see bright signal, this, this little rectangle, gray rectangles where uh, theoretically we're imaging in this diagram and you see bright signal from the inflow of arterial blood or from the inflow of uh, venous blood. Um, you can use a 2D time of flight technique. That's a really good setup, but potentially for the carotids and the vertebral. Arteries need to get nice thin slices. It does take a while then uh, to do, um, but oftentimes we then use a 3D time of flight at the bifurcation where there's more complex flow. Okay, the background tissues appear dark because the TR uh, time, the repetition time being utilized is uh, very short. So it's much shorter than what the uh, TR time, the T1 uh, time uh, basically for the brain or or uh, muscles is. So our TR time, our imaging time is uh, probably 20 to 50 milliseconds and your T1 of brain tissue is 800 to 950 milliseconds. So you keep putting in all these TR signals that knock away uh, the signal where you uh, are imaging that makes that tissue dark. And then since the blood is flowing, it flows in and it will appear as bright. So for another diagram of that, so where you have your static spins, uh, the uh, TR pulse, pulse keeps coming in and knocking down the signal so it doesn't regrow and get bright, it stays dark. But then you have flowing spins, which hasn't received that uh, pulse every you know, 20, 50 milliseconds, it doesn't get knocked down, so it remains bright. So your inflow blood, it could be inflow of arterial blood or it could be inflow of venous blood, it remains bright and that's why you basically see it on a time of flight MRA. Time of flight MRA is a very uh, basically specialized uh, T1 type imaging. If you look at your normal T1 images, you might see bright signal in those arteries because of the same effect, the inflow of unsaturated blood. Now to just see an artery, what is done is like a saturation slab is put on the side where the venous blood is coming in. So, and as in the brain, as in most places of the uh, body, arterial blood is basically flowing one way and venous blood is flowing the opposite way. Not always so clear, clean cut, but it works out real well uh, in the brain and in the neck. So to see the arteries, you put a saturation slab that knocks out all the signal like above the area that you're imaging. So here is where you're imaging, there's your imaging slice. And so you put this saturation slab up here that knocks out all the venous signal. Of course, the arterial signal proceeds in, the arterial blood proceeds in with the high signal that hasn't been saturated. And so then you just see the artery. Time of flight MRA, uh, you want to keep that TE short also because that uh, lessens the time for a uh, signal to be phased. You get better, basically, arterial signal. You won't lose signal so much in areas of complex.
or uh, areas of complex flow. Smaller voxels, that's good to, to you know, you better anatomically define the vessel. And also the smaller uh, voxels results in a more homogeneous blood per voxel. And uh, that has an added bonus of not losing so much signal and helping optimize uh, the visualization of that artery. And uh, so you can have a loss of signal due to complex flow because of underlying stenoses or of tortuous arteries. And uh, 3D time of flight MRA does better where there's tortuous arteries or even uh, complex flow. And so we use particularly 3D time of flight MRA for looking at the brain arterial circulation where the vessels are rather complex and uh, curve in multiple directions. And also uh, we get a 3D time of flight dedicated at the uh, carotid, carotid bifurcation where there is rather a complex flow of the blood as it comes from the carotid artery into the internal carotid artery because that carotid bifurcation often is uh, dilated up. To really potentially optimize your signal on an MRA, there's a time of flight technique called uh, like ZTE, time of flight zero TE. It's uh, pre-pulse, this pulse is prepared such that your TE is extremely short. And so that really cuts out dephasing effects that you can have from complex flow. And complex flow often occurs where there's uh, stenosis, almost always is occurring where there's a stenosis. So this is a very helpful example of this. Here's a CTA, CTA of a middle cerebral artery right in here and you have some stenosis, it's not too bad, it looks like 34%. With the ZTE, the zero TE, the very short TE MRI, does a very good job of showing that stenosis at around 32%. And when you go back to more of a regular time of flight MRA, you see because of, presumptively because of the complex flow and uh, dephasing of that uh, turbulent flow through that area, you get uh, greater stenosis. So you get an overestimation of the stenosis with your regular time flight MRA. So that's a good argument to use a very short, your ZTE uh, technique if you have that available. So MRA pitfalls, uh, loss of signal of the normal carotid bifurcation. It has a normal area of dilation and normal complex flow, and you get flow reversal and loss of signal, and uh, can actually even make it look like it's stenotic when it's a wide open large uh, carotid bifurcation, uh, particularly that happens on 2D time of flight, not so much on 3D time of flight. Uh, some advantage of 2D time of flight is where you have slow flow, 2D time of flight likely shows that slow flow better than uh, 3D time of flight. So each has some uh, strengths and uh, weaknesses. Also, you can't do large volumes of imaging. You have to do like multiple small volumes if you want to cover a larger area with the 3D time of flight. So that makes it kind of a long uh, technique and you have to acquire it in the axial plane. So you can't do it in the coronal plane, uh, like in the head and neck and catch a bunch of arterial signal in your distal coronal volume because that gets saturated out. So you have to do axial plane where you get a nice inflow into each axial slice and you can't make that imaging volume uh, too big. Again, a key is 3D time of flight. It's basically better for areas of complex. Here we have about the best example that I could find where you have a very small internal carotid artery. Here's a 2D time of flight. So it's uh, quite small, uh, little flow in it. And you do see it better on the 2D time of flight than the 3D time of flight, presumptively since this is slow flow, uh, 3D time of flight, it's getting saturated out a little bit and doesn't show up quite as good. All right, so what happens, uh, we've been talking about really uh, to optimize your signal, actually throughout imaging, uh, this can be applied to many different situations. To optimize your imaging and your signal with MRI, you want constructive interference, you want to get magnetic waves adding together. So you want to do things that uh, keep your signal potentially more homogeneous. Uh, so uh, maybe smaller voxels can give you a more homogeneous blood. And so then if you have more homogeneous blood in a smaller voxel, those signals are, will be able to uh, be kept in phase and then they'll uh, add up and you'll get a brighter signal. So if you have a lot of tortuous complex flow of your blood, 
uh, they will become out of phase and then those signals instead of really adding will subtract from each other and so you'll end up with your uh, total signal being a smaller amount. So you want to do things for your technique be it MRA or diffusion or whatever you're doing to help keep that signal homogeneous and in phase. So here is a key really all these uh, MRA uh, techniques, uh, the time of flight and the Gadolinium enhanced hands anyway, are T1 uh, techniques and so things that are bright on T1 will be bright on your time of flight sequences. So that's the benefit potentially of using phase contrast is that uh, T1 objects will not be bright. Of course they just aren't as robust, they don't show arteries as good, they suffer more from dephasing in areas of complex blood flow. So the T1 hyper intense things the biggest problem is blood. So you could potentially have a artery with blood clot in it. Blood clot may be subacute. It may appear as T1 bright. You might look at your MRA and it might look similar as your vessels with flow. So you can have flow that's bright. You can have clots that bright and you're trying to use the technique to tell whether it's clot slash no flow versus flow and that can confound. Usually if there's a clot, it won't be quite as bright. Maybe it won't even be T1 bright at all but it's a theoretical possibility that can happen. So other things that are T1 bright will also appear bright on your uh, time of flight regadling enhanced MRA techniques. Of course, that goes without saying, you're looking for T1 uh, bright objects when you're doing a gadolinium enhanced MRI. This large bright area here was a hemorrhage into the frontal lobe from a anterior cerebral artery aneurysm. You can see this anterior cerebral artery here is uh, very irregular, has multiple uh, aneurysms, some sac saccular, some more fusiform. And this mushroom shaped thing here, this is really would just be a big aneurysm, more likely than not, a big aneurysm that's not filled with clot, but it, due to the complex flow, it, it uh, looks like that. And you're losing signal where it's, the blood is really swirling around down near the base. So you have a jet of flow into the aneurysm and then it starts swirling around and it's keeping in phase up through the area where you see it and then it has tumbled and moved so much that it's totally defaced and it's dark in this area. Now you could have clot in this area, uh, very likely it's just area that still uh, has blood flow in it, uh, but it's just really complex. You can't say for sure. Uh, off of this time of flight MRA technique. Now, and again, this big area, this is clot. This is a hemorrhage. One of, there's a small aneurysm that had hemorrhage. So with the gadolinium MRA and MRV, you try to time it uh, more towards when you have optimal enhancement of the structure you're interested in. And you do that um, by manipulating how you're filling a case space. You, aim for filling the center of case space first. So this is a very good example. You can see good examples with these techniques of how case space truly does give you more contrast centrally and more sharpness of the edges in the periphery. So these case space acquisitions are uh, manipulated to help improve contrast and that manipulation can also be utilized to get a uh, better uh, temporal resolution. So basically, like with the MRA, you aim to capture the center of case space when your, your contrast is uh, well uh, filling the artery, but not into the venous system. And you just need to get that center of case space for a very short period of time, and it really uh, pops your contrast of the artery and uh, suppresses uh, the venous appearance. This is applied to a number of different techniques to sort of uh, optimize that early contrast to the timing uh, that you want. So this is what I'm talking about. You got your case space, how your phase and frequency domain of your magnetic sequence uh, signal, basically your case space. And so you get that center of case space first. It's called elliptic centric. You get that center of case space uh, first. Uh, may have heard of spiral techniques, basically kind of a mini spiral technique where you're getting your center of case space to really, really optimize your contrast. And so down here, right in that center, you get uh, contrast. And then uh, this rest of this data is obtained later and that gives you more um, edge. And it can really 
by doing this uh, particularly with MRA you can suppress the venous signal when you run the MRV basically you're going to get the artery because even when you begin your sequence with optimal venous signal you still have gadolinium less left in the vein so it doesn't uh, left in the artery so it really doesn't suppress the arteries all that well here we have a time of flight uh, technique a single slice from the brain Here's a gadolinium enhanced MRA done with elliptic centric technique. And so they have a treated aneurysm. And you can see a little bit of flow here with the time of flight MRA technique. You got a little bit of flow here, not quite as strongly seen as when you give the gadolinium, you get better flow. So the gadolinium often helps uh, define flow into areas of uh, treated aneurysms uh, better. The downside is you can get uh, venous uh, contamination. And here you can see this is an isolated vein more to the uh, venous uh, side where the peripheral case space, you just got the edge here, you got the edge, you didn't really see the uh, center of this vein because uh, there was no gadolinium there when you got the center of a case space. So this was uh, actually performed uh, fairly well for separating the arterial to the venous uh, signal. And you can get these like fluoro techniques uh, when the gadolinium is coming in, uh, you don't see any contrast here. Here you see it in the pulmonary artery. Here the art uh, contrast had come up into the arch and it was up into the carotid. So then you'd start your actual diagnostic sequence. At that point, you'd get your elliptic centric technique, your center of case space first to uh, get all that contrast in the artery, get your contrast signal from the arteries, and then you'd fill in the the peripheral uh, case space uh, later when there's contrast in both uh, artery and vein, but it ends up suppressing the uh, venous uh, signal uh, very well by using elliptic centric technique. And in this case, you can see this is internal carotid artery right here, and they do have a high grade uh, stenosis. And in general, we, we would have got a 3D time of flight technique uh, through this area also to uh, help uh, maybe better delineate. So the, the 3D technique would take longer Maybe it's four to five minutes to run here. This whole gadolinium technique, uh, probably running at about a minute and a half or so. Uh, so the 3D time of flight technique takes longer. So it is uh, prone to more motion artifacts um, because it just takes longer, basically. All right, now we'll move on to looking at EPI MRI techniques. For EPI imaging, what you need in general are fast gradients. Most MRIs anymore come with fast gradients to perform a pretty good uh, diffusion tensor imaging, diffusion weighted imaging. Of course, you can pay up to even get faster gradients that are more powerful that can really optimize uh, these techniques. These fast gradients help you uh, basically image uh, faster, they turn on and off faster, so you can uh, perform your images with shorter TE. And usually if you have a short TE, you have less artifact. A uh, problem in general with DTI is it's these fast gradients, a uh, little bit more unstable and you can get uh, neurostimulation. What sequences, what techniques, Basically, uh, many techniques are utilized. These might be uh, diffusion imaging. This would probably be the uh, most extensive uh, utilized uh, technique is the diffusion imaging looking for acute subacute strokes. Do a moderate amount of uh, perfusion imaging to look at the perfusion characteristics. I uh, can do that for stroke. Uh, if you're usually doing it more for uh, tumors. You can use it for functional MRI. That's called uh, BOLD imaging. Uh, I can use EPI as kind of single shot, basically fast imaging of the brain in uncooperative uh, patients. You can use imaging, uh, EPI imaging to uh, get uh, real-time images basically of the beating uh, human heart. That's one way to uh, do that. So with EPI, most of the time uh, for neuro to really optimize the uh, speed uh, we do a single shot imaging. Basically, you're getting all a uh, case space for a slice in uh, one snapshot. Usually, you're dealing with a uh, 128 by 128 uh, matrix, so a little bit lower matrix than your anatomical images. These images in general will have a bit lower uh, resolution, often maybe around two to three millimeters rather than uh, 
around uh, one millimeter or uh, even uh, slightly less on your more high resolution anatomic imaging. Now you can break that single shot down into a multi-shot uh, EPI. You can use that to potentially uh, achieve uh, higher resolution and it does help decrease some of the artifacts but basically it's going to take longer so if you break your single shot down into four multi shots it's going to take four times as long so you give up a fair amount of the time advantage and a lot of the EPI what you're doing it for is a time advantage you want to uh, image the brain a lot to uh, evaluate some sort of physiological motion that's uh, happening relatively fast and so in general uh, we're using uh, single shot EPI techniques to optimize uh, this. For instance if you wanted uh, to have a 256 matrix and you only wanted to get 64 echoes in each application instead of 128 then you need uh, four shots uh, basically four uh, imaging uh, times to acquire that so it'll take uh, four times longer. Right, just another example of uh, EPI uh, pulse sequence where you're getting uh, all these echoes without uh, rephasing. So you can traverse uh, K space uh, relatively uh, fast. Again, probably you're talking about single shot, most likely probably about 128 echoes. So if you got single shot, basically this is a nice example from mriquestions.com. Uh, single shot you're basically stamping all of k-space uh, in one a tr with multi-shot you split that up and you might sample it um, you know four times so again that would take uh, four times longer but you would be able to have a shorter te by utilizing this which uh, results in uh, less artifact so uh, like with conventional spin echo imaging you're only getting one echo for TR, not uh, 128, and you will uh, basically kind of slowly work your way through a case space on imaging, getting an echo every, you know, if your TR is 3,000, like for a TT weighted image, you'd be getting an echo every uh, three seconds rather than 128 echoes every uh, you know, three to five seconds. So here is an example of EPI diffusion weighted imaging. This is a pretty good quality one. They held nice and still. So you see these artifacts. The artifacts particularly occur at tissue interfaces, uh, be that with uh, air or bone. So you see it more down around the skull base, uh, particularly around uh, sinuses. You can see it around uh, mastoids. So this area wasn't rephased basically, and you have this artifact, you can get a fair amount up on the frontal lobes. So this is uh, T2 flare imaging where a uh, signal was rephased to remove those artifacts. Now you can see the anatomy, for instance, very nicely down there in the temporal lobe. So it does cause some problems. Uh, can miss uh, infarcts where these artifacts occur, potentially, um, those areas, though, usually aren't the primary areas where an infarct is going to occur, but certainly it can be an area, or if there's a tumor in that uh, region, then you're not going to be getting an optimal evaluation because of these artifacts. So, you know, look at your source data, not just the maps, uh, then you'll know where all your artifacts are and how much you can trust the data from the areas. So, uh, if you have appropriate phase and frequency or optimal phase and frequency, you can decrease artifacts. If you do your phase encoding, encoding along the natural axis of symmetry of the brain, you get uh, a lot less artifacts than if you go uh, perpendicular, like uh, in this example, I uh, don't go uh, right to left, but go uh, AP, and you end up with uh, less artifacts. Still have some artifacts, but just Here's an example of the advantage of multi-shot over uh, single-shot EPI imaging. When you use the multi-shot, you're able to decrease your TE and uh, image during that shot a little faster, so you results in a little bit less artifact than you have on the uh, single-shot MRI up there in the uh, frontal region. So er things to do to decrease artifact, thinner slices, 
higher in-plane resolution. Basically, you're making your uh, voxels uh, smaller, so that helps uh, decrease your artifacts. And if you do things to get shorter uh, TE, potentially doing multi-shot, of course, that takes longer. Or if you have faster and more powerful uh, gradients, so you can uh, get your encoding done faster, basically, so the gradients can turn on and off faster, uh, you get a shorter TE and uh, your TEs are uh, closer together. And so that can result in less artifacts. It is that lack of RF refocusing that results in a number of those artifacts that I was showing you, but it's also that lack of RF refocusing that gives a number of the unique qualities to the echoplanar imaging and hence why we use it. It helps us show uh, numerous physiological processes, be it uh, you know, the flow of gadolinium to give us some perfusion imaging, the uh, changing of oxygenation for uh, functional imaging. Uh, without refocusing, you improve your section efficiency and basically can image uh, faster. And by utilizing all that, you can also get snapshot anatomical imaging to get basically diagnostic imaging in a patient when they're uh, otherwise moving and the uh, standard techniques result in too many artifacts. So the chemical shift uh, with EPI it actually occurs in the phase encoding rather than in the frequency encoding with your normal uh, type of imaging, it would be frequency, frequency encoding uh, direction. So that's why uh, basically these EPI techniques, uh, fat suppression techniques are utilize uh, that suppresses out the fat and then you won't see these uh, phase shifts that cause uh, artifacts. Uh, these off resonance precessing basically uh, result in the geometric uh, distortions and uh, if you compare a EPI image to your um, spin echo imaging there's distortions of the imaging and uh, the anatomy doesn't uh, match up uh, exactly. Uh, there are some fancy ways to help warp them back to make them more similar uh, in appearance. With these off resonant effects in echoplanar imaging, things can be done to minimize them or uh, resolve them. And Basically, I've uh, mentioned these, you can uh, decrease your echo train time. Uh, that can be potentially done by decreasing your resolution. Um, so uh, you don't tax the gradient so much. They can acquire, they, they don't need to acquire so much uh, data in any given time period. And so your TE basically comes down. With that shorter TE, you get less dephasing during that uh, TE time. So that can help you decrease your uh, effects. Uh, the problem is if you decrease your resolution to help decrease the off resonance effects, you're also uh, limiting your resolution and to uh, stop geometric distortions, um, you want to optimize your resolution. Now also you just want to optimize your resolution to uh, evaluate the brain structures often. You can swap your phase and frequency encoding directions, had uh, shown you what can happen with that. And if you put that uh, phase encoding direction along your natural axis of symmetry, the uh, images appear better. And of course, if you have higher performing, faster gradients, um, you can decrease your readout time that results in less artifacts. Parallel imaging can be applied to your EPI techniques. This makes them perform faster and basically your TE time comes down and by doing this you decrease your artifacts. You need to use a multi-channel coil. It might be 8 channels, 16, 32, maybe 64. More channels, the more signal, the more potential for improving your imaging using uh, the parallel technique. So in this diagram, basically, with a eight channel head coil, you have eight spots that are collecting the signal from the brain. And with parallel imaging, the MRI machine software is able to use that 
geometric information from each coil. So each coil's data for the brain is going to be slightly different, and the software can take that data and help create the image with potentially using less of it so you can accelerate the imaging. So parallel imaging is basically a reconstruction technique. The acceleration factor that you utilize cannot be greater than the number of coils that you have in your system. So in this diagram, you wouldn't be able to accelerate faster than eight. Now that'd be way too fast anyway. You probably wanna start running out of signal after you accelerate maybe two times, maybe three times, something uh, like that. Another way you can potentially accelerate your imaging, including EPI imaging now, is you can use compressed sense. And so instead of using the coils and the known geometric uh, signal associated with each coil, this is a manipulation of the case space harkens back to sort of elliptic centric imaging. Basically with this uh, compressed sense, you're gonna be oversampling the center of K space to get all your contrast and pop out your image with good signal. And then you selectively uh, undersample a K space so that you get a nice sharp image, but don't have to spend all the time getting every single point in K space. So classically, you just work your way through K-space image every every point, and if the patient holds still over that rather long period of time, you'll have a wonderful image, but uh, it is going to take you a long time. So basically, if you use this compressed sense and uh, smartly uh, basically sample the center of K-space and the peripheral K-space, you can get a well-balanced appearing image that looks sharp, has good signal, and acquiring it fast. Again, if you just go conventionally, you'll have a nice sharp image with high signal, but it's gonna take a long time. And actually, because it takes that time, the uh, patients, because they're sick, they're here because they're not feeling well, they're uh, more likely to move, and then they get uh, motion degraded. So this seems to work uh, really well. We have it applied to most of our sequences. With EPI MRI, the benefits are our reduced imaging time. You can image the brain really quite fast, and this gives its greatest application of imaging rapid physiological processes of the human body, and also kind of a secondary benefit that we don't use as much as we could is you can use EPI techniques to decrease motion artifacts in patients who are moving. The drawbacks are the sensitivity to susceptibility effects where you're seeing artifacts down around brain bone interfaces, brain air interfaces. It's very sensitive to inhomogeneities in the magnetic field. You get these long gradient echo trains that cause greater uh, T2 star weighting. So that can be utilized uh, to your benefit or it can be a disadvantage potentially and to pull off these EPI images, you need uh, high performance gradients. Most MR machines come with high performance gradients. Maybe they're not as good as would be optimal. And of course, if you really, really want to optimize your EPI uh, techniques, buying uh, the, the strongest, fastest gradients that you have uh, is quite beneficial. We'll look more in depth at an application, echoplanar imaging. We'll look at functional MRI. This is a bold technique, blood oxygenation level dependent contrast. We're not directly looking at neuronal activity at all. Basically, we're measuring changes by imaging of deoxyhemoglobin. So the deoxyhemoglobin is an endogenous paramagnetic contrast agent. Uh, increase deoxyhemoglobin and get decreased signal. Uh, with brain function, when you perform an activity that involves an area of the brain, though, you get oxygen oversupply. So you get oxygen oversupply um, because the oxygen delivery and metabolism 
aren't closely linked. The uh, glucose metabolism and cerebral blood flow changes are closely coupled, but with that uh, inflow of oxygen, you get less deoxyhemoglobin and more oxyhemoglobin, and that oxyhemoglobin causes the signal to increase. So this is done. I can use different techniques. The EPI technique is the most commonly utilized technique. Uh, best at a three Tesla certainly can get some fairly nice uh, fMRIs on a good uh, 1.5 uh, Tesla uh, machine, but uh, 3T just going to optimize your uh, signal. The EPI so with your fMRI, what happens is you have your uh, task, you get your localized neuronal activity. So we're not imaging this. A number of things have to occur before we get our uh, MRI signal. Be your increased metabolic rate, vasodilation, increased blood volume, increased blood flow, decreased uh, deoxy, and basically increased oxyhemoglobin. So you get less dephasing from the deoxy, you got more oxyhemoglobin, more signal. And so that's uh, more or less why you end up with increased MRI uh, signal. The bold response is sensitive in and around large draining veins. The extent of this effect is decreased due to the inmixing of blood from non-activated cortex. So that's kind of a problem because you might have adjacent veins uh, bringing in blood from non-activated cortex and it can kind of wash out your signal. So there's different techniques, basically gradient echo or spin echo EPI techniques. The gradient echo is more sensitive and since it's kind of a signal start technique and you want to optimize seeing your areas of activation, uh, most fMRI is performed with a gradient echo uh, technique. Uh, if you use spin echo, you'd be a little bit more specific but you're going to see less signal. So bottom line, gradient echo, you're going to see more signal. Uh, you'll see that signal into larger vessels and uh, maybe maybe it'll lead to uh, you know seeing too much signal. That's usually not the problem. You just want to optimize seeing as much signal as you can. But the spin echo technique is more specific for where the activation is occurring in uh, smaller vessels uh, within the parenchyma. Because the signal changes, the oxyhemoglobin can flow away from the area of activation. This has been called the draining vein problem. Basically, you might start seeing your area of activation in tissues that aren't actually activated because of the flow of blood away from the areas where the activation is truly occurring in. Um, people have called, optimists have called that and saying, maybe this isn't a problem. Maybe this vein will help you point to the area of activation. Uh, this is secondary to these techniques being relatively uh, signal starved. The hemodynamic response is sluggish. Basically, you're not seeing this instantaneously. Uh, on the uh, mathematical models where they're looking for the signal change and basically creating statistics of where there's greater signal change, you have to take this into account that the um, maximum area of fMRI activity is basically four to eight seconds after you start the activity. So there's a delay uh, before you start seeing the activity occur and a delay to then uh, the fall off of the activity secondary this hemodynamic response. So basically, here's an example of uh, looking at a pixel that's going to be activating and you start the activity and you don't start seeing the uh, signal going up on your image and then you get a maximum uh, at about here five seconds after when you started and then it falls off, uh, takes a while to fall off and measure your signal uh, after they stop. So that'd be another five seconds. So then they'd actually be stopping their activity here and then it minimizes here. So here's an example of our data from a patient that we uh, ran a right hand finger tap fMRI. 
on. So we see it over here in the left cerebral hemisphere in the kind of lateral hand knob area. I put some ROIs over the statistical areas where the uh, algorithm uh, shows uh, the signal changes that are occurring slash where the activity is uh, basically occurring. And so we start with rest and then activity. About every one that we do, we start with rest to not kind of surprise the patient with the action uh, right away. So you have your rest, and then uh, each of these little areas is actually uh, three seconds. So we have 15 seconds of rest and 15 seconds of activation. And you can see we don't get our peak until, oops, I can draw it down straight, you know. Uh, it's like uh, somewhere between uh, six and nine seconds, uh, basically. And it's not as, as sharp as even that one direction. Uh, one example that I showed you here, you can see this one didn't go up nearly as much and it fell off. Here we got a little bit more of a fall off. So the variability of uh, the signal, something happened here, maybe we moved a little bit or something. We have a quick drop off right, right in the middle. That could be related to some motion artifacts. So problems with the fMRI that I've gone over, neurovascular decoupling. Uh, this can happen from a multiple reasons. We have a tumor, it can happen in areas of stroke or where you have arterial stenosis. Uh, some people have had problems if they're actually seizing uh, during the fMRI. Um, it's been some examples, very unique examples, where the activity actually induces a little seizure focus. That changes the uh, activation pattern that is seen. Also, if you have an inflammatory, infectious, or demyelinating process going on, that can potentially affect your neurovascular uh, decoupling. We check that out a little bit by running a perfusion scan. We also do a breath hold scan and look at the uh, cerebral vascular reactivity. That can give you an idea if that neurovascular uh, decoupling has occurred or not. It's not a perfect method, but it's a method uh, that, that can help out anyway. Also, when you're uh, evaluating your fMRI, you have to make sure that the patient actually isn't doing a second task. So maybe they're moving their feet when they're doing some hand activation. Um, you also have intrinsic problem of when you move, you feel it. So movement does result in some sensation activation. Um, patients are asked to not speak when we're doing like a language, just to read words silently or to think of words silently. Don't uh, say them out loud because that would obviously uh, invoke uh, another network. We use a number of different methodologies to deliver our paradigms. Predominantly, we're using a visual system. Uh, we have a flashing checkboard uh, that we use to actually check the visual fields, but we also, for our language task, basically use a visual stimulation where we're showing words, we're showing letters, sentences, uh, pictures. Probably if you ran a memory stimulation uh, technique, we would use a visual paradigm. We don't have one of these set up right now. Also, our directions for all the paradigms are basically uh, given uh, visually. We're also talking to the patient over uh, headphones and we can perform a passive listening paradigm, but this hasn't been turning out so well. You know, MRI is a noisy environment and the passive listening, uh, the reading uh, to the patient that's often uh, drowned out by all the uh, MRI uh, noise. Sensory, uh, to do that, uh, we use a toothbrush that uh, does a pretty good job for invoking a sensory stimulus. A lot of papers in the literature on using pins for more of a painful stimulus, which would give you slightly different activation than with uh, a toothbrush on the skin. Here is an example of a fMRI. Basically, these blobs are a statistical map where the signal intensity changes occurred, where there was uh, statistically increased uh, oxygenation. Basically, we kind of uh, 
choose a statistical level that shows us blobs, areas of activation where we expect. Uh, so there is some um, bias certainly in uh, developing these and there's variation between people. So there's not a definite statistical level that is optimal necessarily for showing these uh, activations. Kind of choose what looks good. So that's a uh, variable in the an analysis paradigm. So with verb generation, they would see a noun and the patient uh, thinks of a verb. So maybe car, drive, crash, you know, bucket, fill, pour, dump, something like that. So here's word generation activation in a normal subject. This is again pretty similar. Uh, usually verb generation, if they pull it off, might be a little more robust, show a little more uh, activation. Uh, some people have more of a problem doing the verb generation than the word generation. So in the word generation, they're seeing a letter and they're supposed to think of a noun. So predominantly we're seeing activation in the Brokaw's area and we're not seeing so much in uh, Wernicke's area. So when we're trying to decide what's being activated, uh, you can have a set parameter really in a selected research population when you're doing kind of basically heterogeneous population with lesions in their uh, brain. You need to vary your statistical uh, number to see what kind of shows you uh, focal areas of activation and not activation through, throughout the whole brain. So you got to vary your uh, statistical parameter, uh, your z-score. Uh, potentially might be what you're using. So this was too low. You see, uh, you do see where there's stronger activation, but you also see activation all throughout the brain. They have this lesion um, basically in the premotor area. So you tone it down, you really raise this z-score high. This is probably uh, too high and you don't see much activation at all. This is uh, kind of more similar. Basically you have uh, activation in this hand knob area going right up to the uh, lesion. So this lesion would be more premotor uh, coming up and getting into probably the lateral uh, motor strips. So you'd overlay this onto your uh, anatomical image and adjust them, um, make sure that they're overlapping uh, nicely. So you can get artifacts like this with uh, MRI. This can be due to uh, basically a mismapping due to uh, gradients, um, maybe not turning on and off quite exactly as they should, called a Nyquist uh, ghost, the N2 ghost, kind of gets offset by half. He uh, also gets sort of the same artifact potentially due to a little bit of uh, patient motion. You'll see this image shifted by half of the image. Don't see this so much. We used to see this. Uh, more previously, uh, I guess the scanners are made just a little bit better. Gradients turn on and off a little bit sharper. Things are a little bit more stable. And so that's really has helped decrease the visualization of the uh, Nyquist ghosting. Don't see that too often anymore. We do uh, some cerebral vascular reactivity mapping and continue to evaluate how much it's uh, helping us so that can help us evaluate if there is or is not neurovascular coupling in the areas that we're uh, interested in. So that can change or basically go away secondary to the underlying lesion. We can do this in a really complex fashion and have patients breathe CO2 uh, mixtures with special tanks and tubing uh, that you have in your MR system. That's really uh, rather a complex method, probably the most pure method. There's a lot of work done out of Johns Hopkins where you can do breath hold. People can do this pretty good. We uh, basically do a breath hold technique. Uh, patients free breathe for like 42 seconds and they take in a breath for over three seconds and then they hold it for 15 seconds and we repeat that uh, five times. It works out pretty good. Not perfect. There have been nice experiments that have been ran and uh, demonstrated for showing how changing CO2 correlates as would be physiologically expected with your uh, bold uh, signal. So it does seem like that is truly demonstrating uh, 
physiological change. So here's a patient that did uh, cerebrovascular mapping. I believe it was a breath hold technique. They have a lesion here in their left cerebral hemisphere. And unfortunately, the cerebrovascular mapping, uh, you don't see changes. You don't see the neurovascular coupling within the lesion. So then on the fMRI, you have areas of activation right next to it, but you really don't know if uh, that means there's not activity within the lesion or if it's just not showing up because lack of the uh, needed neurovascular coupling for fMRI to show the activation of this area. So, um, you know, they'd have to basically do testing and see if they get disruption of the action at surgery uh, to see how far this language activation really extends into the lesion. And that brings us to the end of our first part of the lecture. Thank you.